not just for his music, but for his political courage. His final encore, The Stars and Stripes Forever, a bridge, he told us, between his old home in the Soviet Union and his new friends in America. Hong Kong is a glittering capitalist enclave on the South China coast, Britain's last jewel in the crown. It was once said that Hong Kong is a borrowed place living on borrowed time, and now that time is running out. It's so plain that China is not going to give us anything more than token democracy. So the whole thing is not going to work. The, the beautiful dream of one country, two systems will soon turn into a nightmare of one country no system. Up until 1974, there was only one black in the Birmingham Fire Department. And until 1981, there were no black officers. As of now, the city has reached its goal of roughly one-third black man and lieutenant. That's why Charlie Jackson of the Birmingham Fire Department claims he can't get promoted beyond lieutenant. If I was passed over in 88 to the position of captain simply because there were uh, blacks promoted in, in that position who I made a higher score on, and, and I did not get promoted, simply because I was not black. I'm Mike Wallace. I'm Morley Safer. I'm Harry Reasoner. I'm Ed Bradley. I'm Steve Croft. Those stories and Andy Rooney tonight on 60 Minutes. Good. It definitely doesn't taste like brand. Introducing Kellogg's Ken My Rice Brand, brand that doesn't taste like brand. Come on, what is it really? Ken My Rice Brand. Brand? No way. Ken My has a different kind of brand from whole brown rice, so it's light and crunchy. No, no, brand tastes brandy. This is uh, not brandy. Ken My Rice Brand, brand that doesn't taste like brand. <laughs> this is uh, this is good. We interrupt this program for an important potato announcement. So far in McDonald's Fried Surprise Game, Spud Lovers have won over $25 million in cash and prizes, like Grant Eric Stone, the big $10,000 winner. So get off your couch, potatoes, and play McDonald's Fried Surprise Game today. In one out of two homes in America, people rely on Kenmore appliances. So you don't have to go far to find the best. Come over to our house. Kenmore. Only at Sears and Sears Brand Central. When choosing a new car, don't compromise. Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme SL is longer and wider. It accelerates faster than Ford Taurus. It's more powerful, yet gets better highway gas mileage than Honda Accord. And it has a better owner satisfaction plan than both. Which obviously makes Cutlass Supreme the smarter choice. All the way around. This is the new generation of all. Now get up to $2,600 cash back on a 1990 Cutlass Supreme. See your old dealer today. Slava is Mstislav Rostropovich, one of the world's top symphony conductors, the world's finest cellist. He fled into exile from his Soviet homeland 16 years ago because he demanded the right for dissidents to talk as they please, for writers to write as they please. And that was an unacceptable affront to the Soviet leadership. He and his wife, Galya, Galina Vishnevskaya, the premier Soviet opera star before she too went into exile, were stripped of their citizenship four years after they left Moscow, condemned as enemies of the people. But Glasnost invited them back earlier this year. Their citizenship restored by order of Mikhail Gorbachev himself. And Slava, leading his National Symphony Orchestra of Washington, was back on the podium of the Moscow Conservatory. homecoming two days before that concert was worthy of an international rock star. For more than a moment, it seemed he might never make it through the airport terminal. And then off to Moscow with his wife Galina and his daughter Olga. 
and clearing their way of police escorts now for this man who had been forced to leave his country directly to Novodovice Cemetery to pay respects to several great Soviet musicians, late friends of Slava, whose careers too had been strangled by the Soviet dictatorship. Finally, home to their old Moscow apartment in the House of Composers. It had never been confiscated by the government. That night, Slava and Galina entertain old friends they haven't seen for years. And all of this, mind you, on a day after a flight from Tokyo to Moscow. The rest of us might have craved some rest, not Slava. <laughs> Amid all the private and public bedlam of the next couple of days, legions of old friends come to see Slava. He hustled from one press conference to another, in and out of rehearsal halls. He wants some time alone with his cello, but that's impossible, for Slava simply hungers for company. And then the big night arrives. Slava prepares in his dressing room for the concert he has waited for so long. His first piece, Tchaikovsky's Symphony Pathétique. This music holds profound meaning for Slava, for this was the last piece he performed in Moscow before being driven into exile. But this performance tonight is as much emotional and political as it is a musical triumph. And in the most prominent box just off the stage, an old friend, the Queen of Spain, in the white dress, and sitting next to her, Raisa Gorbachev. Slava is called back six times by the audience. The people here are celebrating one of their own, not just for his music, but for his political courage. Final encore, The Stars and Stripes Forever. A bridge, he told us, between his old home in the Soviet Union and his new friends in America, some of whom have come all the way from the U.S. for the concert. <laughs> Slava told us that for him and his family, this is his daughter, Olga. This is a simply unforgettable night. Slava plays the virtuoso piece that seems to belong to him, Dvorak's cello concerto. considered the world's finest cellist. Sixteen years ago, he had been hounded from Soviet concert halls, told, in fact, by one minor official that, as a musician, he had simply degenerated too much. Okay. Oh. The root of Slava and Ganya's political difficulties lay in a place that also gave them so much delight. Their Dasha, their country home outside Moscow. Slava himself had helped design and build it. Very nice. I like that. Thank you. Yeah. 
Грейс Архитектор. Yes. Галина... Маэстро Строповец. Yes. Я сделал его на Галина Мачлеска и кисает не аз архитект, ден аз музыкант. Я? Yeah? Yes. Sure. In, In 1969, they invited dissident writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who would come under increasing persecution from the government, invited him to live in this cottage just by their main house. Galina had thought it might be too small for him. Sanya, how possible it is for you if this is a small place? He was, Galia, I never in my life li lived like that. It's like palazzo for me, like palazzo. For the next four years, the Nobel Prize winning author wrote some of his most acclaimed works at this dasha. And though he had no money himself, he would accept nothing from the Rostropovichs except shelter. He lived here on just one ruble a day. And in this refrigerator, he has cabbage and spaghetti. That's all. And, and milk. And milk. Solzhenitsyn worked here dawn to dusk, leaving his writing, they said, only to pace back and forth in the woods outside. Like tigers. Go, go, and go to the table. Right. Again. As the official campaign against Solzhenitsyn intensified, most Soviet intellectuals remained silent. But Slava spoke out. He wrote an open letter defending Solzhenitsyn. But no Moscow paper would publish it, so he gave it to the Western press. That did it. He was immediately deemed persona non grata by Moscow. He wrote to Pravda back in the 70s. Why in our literature and our art, why is the decisive word always spoken by people who are absolutely incompetent in those matters? Why? Why? Answer the question. Why people incompetent or why I wrote? Why in a, no. Why did you write? And why? I write because that people are incompetent. <laughs> and why are the people incompetent? Why did that kind of people? Fist in my ear. Fist in. <laughs> and yet it went on for 70 years. Exactly. In 1973, the government finally stripped Solzhenitsyn of his citizenship, ordered him into exile. After he left the cottage, Two men from the KGB appeared to remove a black box, electronic listening equipment that had been buried for years beneath the cottage floor. So they were eavesdropping on Solzhenitsyn. Exactly. exactly. As the Kremlin saw it, Slava and Galina had the wrong kind of friends. Not just Solzhenitsyn, but dissident Andrei Sakharov, who died a few months ago. Slava brought a wreath to his grave, too. When I only coming nearer, I see so many flowers. And I think people now uh, express gratitude, express appreciation to this genius. My tears coming out from my eyes. I so admired him. He admired him so much that back in 1974, when some members of the Bolshoi Theater came to Slava and Galina, and told them that all they had to do was sign a mild public declaration against Sakharov, and that would be enough to restore the two of them to official favor. Galia and Slava refused. Why did you not sign the denunciation of Sakharov? Why not? But I have confidence, that's, that's answer. I have confidence. In 1974, Slava and Galya finally understood they could survive as artists only by leaving Russia, as have so many others. career thrived in the U.S. and Europe, but not Galya. Though at one time, she was the top Soviet soprano, in the West, her career slowly crumbled. And now in the winter of 1990, 
She and Olga walk outside the Bolshoi near the stage door she used at her triumphant concert. Two old friends ask her to come inside, but she refuses. There are too many bitter memories, she told us, of how her fellow musicians, the curry political favor for themselves, had publicly denounced her and Klopp. You were the main diva of the Soviet yes, Union. That's right. And then suddenly comes the 200th anniversary of the Bolshoi. Yes. And you are a non Not one. Not one word about me. Not, not no picture, no nothing, name. Nothing. Nothing. Yes. The Soviet Union. Because you and your husband yes. defended Solzhenitsyn. Yes, yes, yes. And in a strange way, it was tougher for you than it was for Slavs. There is Galia, was it all worth it? Was it worth it? And it could not be any other way. Was it worth it? The 16 years. The exile. The coming home. Was it worth it? write the letter about Solzhenitsyn, not to denounce Sakharov? Yes. I completely repeat all what I make it, even if I have no possibility in my lifetime coming back. For Slava, nothing speaks more eloquently of the artist's struggle against the brutality of dictatorship than the Fifth Symphony of Dmitry Shostakovich, one of the greatest Russian composers of the century. His career, too, almost destroyed by the Kremlin. You should play this music, Slava told his orchestra that night, so it feels like a fork in the brain. The footage for Slava was shot for a documentary film by Peter Gelb and Maisel Film, which will be broadcast on public television next fall. Everyone who takes a vacation should meet a person like this. She's warm, she's personable, and she's an owner of a major U.S. corporation. Where do you find her? At the Avis counter. Okay, you're all set with your Chevy Lumina. Avis Incorporated is the only major rent-a-car company owned by its corporate employees. How do we get free unlimited mileage? I'm friends with the owner. Get free unlimited mileage and low rates on a Chevy Lumina. At Avis, we're trying harder than ever. Did you know that even though your 800 service is working perfectly, something could keep you from getting calls? But only AT&T automatically Hello? covers you with our 800 assurance policy. Within one hour, we can reroute 800 calls to any working phone and any other office, guaranteed. Reliability, another AT&T advantage. Call today about our special 800 offer. We'd heard Century 21 people were the best, and Janet was proof. Don't worry, we'll make your home stand out in the market. She always handled the details, so we never had to worry. Relax, I'll call the bank. 
Janet. She never stopped working. We'd like to sell your home to an out-of-town buyer. She really cared. So when friends ask my advice, I tell them, call the Century 21 office. Don't forget this. It's the only place you'll find people like Janet. Century 21. Someone stole a rare coin. One of a kind. And a rich family's at each other's throats. This guy is also guilty of murder. I'm intrigued. An all-new murder, she wrote. Then, Peter O'Toole, Mayor Winningham, struggling to save innocent children from the brutality of war. Crossing to freedom, tonight. Children playing with matches and gasoline. Innocent mischief turns to horror. As a young boy's life hangs in the balance. Rescue 911. Tuesday. Wow. Valerie Bertinelli, Sydney, Wednesday. No place on earth is more dedicated to making money than the British colony of Hong Kong. Hong Kong is one of Asia's success stories, a thriving center of commerce and finance, a capitalist heaven. But in 1997, the British will hand over that heaven, that bastion of free enterprise, to that bastion of hardline communism, the People's Republic of China. The Chinese have promised to preserve Hong Kong's capitalist lifestyle for another 50 years, but Hong Kong isn't betting on it. Every day at noon on Hong Kong's waterfront, you can still see one of those traditions of the British Empire that Noel Coward used to sing about. Hong Kong, they strike a gong and fire off a new day gun to reprimand each inmate who's in late. But now dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. Of all the places in the once far-flung empire where Englishmen brave the midday sun, only Hong Kong is left. In spite of its brash modern appearance, it is still an old-style colony administered by a British governor with all the trappings of imperial power. Out in the midday sun. And if the five and a half million natives, 98% of them Chinese, could have had anything to do with it, that's the way it would stay, for colonial rule has served them well. With its deep water harbor, which is a free port, and its low taxes, Hong Kong is a place where you can make it and keep it. And once you've got it, you flaunt it. There are more Rolls Royces here than anywhere else in the world, more designer shops than in Palm Beach and Beverly Hills put together. Hong Kong is a glittering capitalist enclave on the South China coast, Britain's last jewel in the crown. But from the beginning, it was a jewel that had a fatal flaw. The British had first forced the Chinese, through some gunboat diplomacy, to sign a treaty that gave them Hong Kong forever. But at the end of the 19th century, Britain gained more land, known as the New Territories, and this time, they had just a 99-year lease. That 99-year lease sealed Hong Kong's fate. Without the new territories, which make up over 90% of this colony, Hong Kong, as it exists today, just couldn't survive. And in July of 1997, when that lease expires, everything will be handed back to China. It was once said that Hong Kong is a borrowed place living on borrowed time. And now that time is running out. Simon Murray is the Taipan, or boss of one of Britain's oldest trading companies in Hong Kong. You've got to understand that this is the only colony, only British colony ever, not to have been given independence at the end of the day, but to be handed over to a, a third party. And we're being handed over to a communist country, and a country from which 50% of the population have already run. So we're essentially refugees and we're essentially, after 140 years, we're being handed back. So, uh, in order to make that work, Britain has got to do a little bit more than it's done so far. Back in 1984, in Beijing, Britain believed it had done the best it could for Hong Kong. In return for Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher agreeing to hand back the colony when the lease expired, Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping promised to let Hong Kong stay capitalist and have its own democratic institutions for the next 50 years. Deng said China would be one country, two systems. And for a time, the people of Hong Kong believed him. Dame Lydia Dunn, the senior member of Hong Kong's executive council, was optimistic. China had been opening their doors. Um, the economy had been improving. The standard of living in, in China had improved. And people in China um, had been 
given more and more freedoms. Um, so the signs were promising. But those promising signs were shattered by the gunfire and tanks and deaths in Tiananmen Square. When a million people took to the streets of Hong Kong to mourn those deaths, Chinese leaders accused the colony of being a hotbed of subversion. And that promise of one country, two systems began to fade. Now, it's so plain that China is not going to give us anything more than token democracy. So the whole thing is not going to work. The, the beautiful dream of one country, two systems will soon turn into a nightmare of one country, no system. Martin Lee is a Hong Kong lawyer who worries how the Chinese would react to democratic dissent in Hong Kong. If you had a case with a million people in the street demonstrating, and the Chinese troops here, what do you think would happen? They're going to shoot. China will kill the people of Hong Kong if necessary, just as they kill their own people in Peking on the 4th of June. After the massacre in Tiananmen Square, Hong Kong's stock market went into a nosedive. Money needs confidence, and suddenly confidence is what Hong Kong didn't have. But no one is hurt by this more than China. It has bigger financial stakes here than either Britain or the United States. Millions of dollars worth of Chinese goods are transshipped through this port. And China owns shares in dozens of Hong Kong companies, including its airline. And in a place where your importance is measured by the height of your office building, the 70-story Bank of China dominates the skyline, a visible symbol of China's window on the capitalist world. But Martin Lee believes that Chinese leaders would sacrifice all of this to stay in power. China needs Hong Kong when the leaders themselves feel they are secure. At the moment, I don't think they do. It's like a robber coming up to you and says, Sir, do you want your life or your money? You say, of course, my life, and here's my money. So they're quite willing to sacrifice the economy of China and, of course, Hong Kong, if in return they believe they get security. But security for the Chinese leaders spells insecurity for the people of Hong Kong, and many are moving out already. And I think it's wise to go to Canada for the time being and settle there, and maybe it's for the good for the children. So if anything happens, well, in Teresa Ip has already packed up all the family's belongings and shipped them out. Her husband, William, has left the family textile business and has no idea what work he'll find in Canada. The Ips are just two of the 50,000 people expected to leave Hong Kong this year alone. Others still search at immigration fairs for a country that will take them. They are in the main educated and middle class, and their departure will have a serious impact on Hong Kong's economy. But why do they need another country? Over three million people in Hong Kong hold British passports like this one. At first glance, it looks just like any other British passport, but read the fine print and you'll notice one important difference. People who hold this passport don't have the right to live in Britain. And after 1997, China will regard all Hong Kong people as Chinese citizens. And this passport, it won't be worth the paper it's written on. The people of Hong Kong now say Britain should give full rights of citizenship to those passport holders. Not so they can leave Hong Kong, but so they can stay. People don't want to leave Hong Kong. They do very well here. But people want to have uh, an insurance that if the worst comes to the worst, if there's a disastrous situation, they are not trapped. That there is another place, another home, that they can go to. But Dame Lydia's appeal has been rejected in London. The truth is, Britain doesn't want them. In 1997 or later, the Chinese don't abide by that agreement. Britain could be faced with over 3 million Chinese British citizens on his doorstep, wanting to come in. Or even worse, three million British citizens trapped here in a civil disturbance in China. Well, what would Britain do then? Send in a gunboat? If that kind of scenario were to, were to happen, um, do you not think Britain has a responsibility to, to people who were, after all, born on British soil, who pledge allegiance to, to the Queen, uh, even today? So it, in the end, it comes to a, a moral question. What are they going to do about it? 
The British have always known that if it ever came to a showdown with China over Hong Kong, there's not much they could do about it. This barbed wire frontier which separates Hong Kong from the Chinese mainland is guarded by troops from the British Gurkha Regiment. But a couple of Gurkhas on bicycles is hardly a sight to deter the armies of a billion Chinese. But they didn't put up this frontier to guard against an invasion by the People's Liberation Army. It's here to prevent thousands of individual Chinese from pouring into Hong Kong, seeking a better life than they have at home. Many still try to get across, but nearly all are caught and bussed back to Chinese officials waiting on the other side. They leave without even having caught a glimpse of Hong Kong, where some Chinese are rich beyond these illegal immigrants' wildest dreams. Kai Bong and Brenda Chow are both British-educated lawyers who have no worries about finding a refuge if their way of life here falls apart after 1997. Like many of their friends, the Chows have spent enough time in Britain to qualify for regular British passports. And they say they would summer in London and winter in Florida or Thailand. You a gambling man, Kai Bong? No, my father used to have a string of horses, but I never have luck in gambling. What do you think the odds are that after 1997 you'll still be here in Hong Kong, still living in this manner? Maybe better, maybe worse. Who knows? Would you know? I don't know. There you are. Mostly people in Hong Kong, they just work hard and make money and hope for the best. In the tea houses of Hong Kong, old men still gather at dawn with their songbirds, a custom they brought with them from China when they fled a generation ago. While the rich can wander the world and the middle classes can seek their fortunes elsewhere, the majority of Hong Kong people have nowhere else to go. They must stay and take what comes. China holds the only key to restore confidence in Hong Kong. But since the 4th of June, quite apart from that terrible day of the massacre, thereafter, the leaders of China has, have not said one single thing or done one single thing which could possibly restore confidence in the people of Hong Kong. Sunset party, ho! When Britain hauls down the Union Jack in 1997 for the last time, Hong Kong, a place that built its fortune on high risk, must face the biggest risk of its existence. And no one's giving up. Last week, the British government introduced a bill in Parliament which would grant full British nationality to 50,000 Hong Kong Chinese and their families. That, the British figure, will keep the best and the brightest from fleeing Hong Kong. But the bill faces a rough time in Parliament, and if it fails, confidence in Hong Kong could collapse and panic could set in long before the Chinese take over. Welcome to the 90s, and welcome to a way to explore new horizons. The new four-door Explorer from Ford. Explore more total room for people and cargo than any competitor. Explore its exclusive push-button four-wheel drive. Explore its aerodynamic design. Discover four-door Explorer from Ford. Have you driven a Ford lately? When Tandy engineered the Model 1000 computer, we created new standards in personal computing. Exclusive features like Instant On Deskmate and Plain English Commands. Our technology team ensures the quality, value, service, and support that sets Tandy apart from all others. The complete Tandy 1000 TL2 hard drive computer system for home or office for only $15.99. Exclusively at Radio Shack, America's technology store. Nobody compares. 60 Minutes, a CBS News weekly magazine, will continue. When Murphy pulls off... It's the greatest practical joke Will things get out of hand? If we had a barn, I swear I'd kick you out there and tan your behind. A new Murphy Brown. Then, Suzanne has a lot to learn about her new best friend's secret. Oh, Suzanne, loosen up. It's the 90s. Yeah, well, it's not the gay 90s. It's an all-new Designing Women right after Murphy Brown, Monday. This is CBS Vision, a clear picture of a goal realized.
a determination to turn resources into results. As ideas come to life, vision brings form to the future. And that makes today a secure place to be. Community Mutual, the strength to lead. I never thought it would happen to me. I mean, first I bought a tape by Alabama. The next thing you know, I'm at the front row for the Judd's concert, and now I have a button on my radio set to WGAR. <laughs> Me, the old Cleveland rock and roller. I like country music. I like it a lot. Discover Cleveland's country music station, WGAR FM 99.5. Dick Goddard, weeknights at 6 and 11 on Cleveland's own New Center 8. The cry used to be, Fireman, save my child. Now it's more likely to be, Fireman, save my job. At least that's the plea of white firemen in the city of Birmingham. It's been eight years since that Alabama city, under pressure from civil rights groups and the Justice Department, initiated a program to make sure that black firemen got a fair share of promotions in the Birmingham Fire Department. The problem is that the white firefighters think it's been anything but a fair share. For eight years, the white firemen have been prevented from doing anything about it except complain. Now, as Harry Reasoner reports, thanks to a Supreme Court decision, they may get their day in court. The way promotions have worked in the fire department, as indeed in most civil service jobs in this country, is that a test is given, and the highest scorers on the list, with some credit for seniority, get the promotions. But since 1981, when Birmingham signed an agreement with the Justice Department, an agreement called a consent decree, in effect there have been two lists, one white and one black, and the top scorers from each race are promoted, even if the whites scored higher than the blacks. That's why Charlie Jackson of the Birmingham Fire Department claims he can't get promoted beyond lieutenant. I was passed over in 88 to the position of captain simply because there were uh, blacks promoted in, in that position who I made a higher score on and, and I did not get promoted simply because I was not black. Fireman Ronnie Chambers took the test for lieutenant in 1981. I quit all my part-time work uh, and really spent about six months studying and trying to prepare myself for this test. And when the results were made known, there were uh, 12 openings at the time. I was number 11 on that list, and to this day, I still have not been promoted. Chambers and Jackson and the other white firemen feel that the promotion list should be in order of the grade scored in the test, regardless of race. I fought for everything that I've got. I earned my way. What happened to the merit system where, where each person gains their promotions by their own merit, not by the color of their skin? One of the requirements is that all of the candidates sent down by the personnel board be qualified, which means that everybody sent down has had a passing grade on the test. But the white firemen say they've lowered the passing grade since 1981. Charles Bryce is a fire lieutenant and a union officer. When I took the test and competed, the, the pass-fail level was at 70%. If, if you didn't answer 70% right, you, pay, uh, you failed. Now we understand they've lowered the pass-fail level below 50%, so there'll be enough minorities on the list that the personnel board can say is qualified. You're saying that passing meant something different before 1981 than it did afterwards. Exactly. Before 1981, when a, when a new lieutenant came into a fire station, everyone there knew that he knew what he was doing because he passed the test. Do any of you feel that some of the black lieutenants that you've known or have not been qualified? Yes without question. Some people would have you believe that the department is going down because of the lower people that they're reaching down. Oh, man, they're scraping the barrels and getting these unqualified, ignorant black people to, to be over our people. Carol Cook is a lieutenant with the fire department. I have looked at the, the statistics that have been turned in on a monthly basis as to how many houses are, are, are burning now as opposed to five or six years ago when you didn't have any blacks 
we have improved. Nothing has happened and to say that the, anything is any less. As a matter of fact, it's better. Susan Reeves, who represented the blacks in their lawsuits, doesn't think the test means anything. There are a lot of qualities, wonderful qualities, that it takes to be a firefighter. But you do not have to be a rocket scientist to be a firefighter. Maybe there should be a test for bravery, for courage, for ability to follow orders, to climb ladders, to go into burning buildings. Those kinds of tests are related to the job. But a pencil and paper test that doesn't predict performance is not a very useful test to me. How else are you going to test it? How do you test other jobs? They do it by a written test. Physicians? They do it by written test. Air pilots, of course, they, they have to fly, but they also pass written tests. Many jobs are done by, or they're tested by written tests. You can find out if they know the job, if they know the material. Up until 1974, there was only one black in the Birmingham Fire Department. And until 1981, there were no black officers. As of now, the city has reached its goal of roughly one-third black man and lieutenant. But the whites in the fire department feel that these black officers have been promoted at their expense. Why should him and him and him have to pay the price for a social problem across the country? Uh, there, there has to be methods and means to deal with this without denying these guys the promotion that they've worked for. There has been no discrimination in the Birmingham Fire Department until the blacks were promoted over the whites. We've talked to some white firefighters. They admit something needed to be done. But they just think this is the wrong way to do it. Captain Jackie Barton. We got old saying that people want uh, Jesus and the jug. What they mean is they want the moral high ground saying, well, yes, this is wrong. This is totally wrong. But yet they want to eat the fruit of that wrong. I mean, you can't have both of them. If you're going to admit it's wrong, all right. But you can't live and enjoy the benefits of this wrong. I mean, you're losing your moral high ground then. We are so sorry that this happened to you, to you people. Uh, but uh, when it comes to correcting it or, or, or implementing some plan of correction, then, well, no, we don't do it yet. Let's not implement it yet. I will have to lose something if it's done now. You wouldn't even let me. I came when I came out of high school. I tried to be a firefighter. And they said, no, we, there is no room at the end. <laughs> Although there was room at the end after 1981. But as blacks were promoted over whites who had scored higher on the test, the whites filed lawsuits, some 40 of them. One of the suits got to the Supreme Court. And last June, the court said the white firemen could sue the city of Birmingham if they thought they were being passed over unfairly for promotion. The attorney who took the case for the white firemen all the way to the Supreme Court and won is Ray Fitzpatrick. I feel it's important to recognize that my clients were denied promotions not on the basis of their qualifications, rather on the basis of their race. The fire chief ignored qualifications when he selected persons for promotion and simply went white, black, white, black, right down two separate lists. That's wrong. We asked Susan Reeves what was new about this decision. What's new is that now the Supreme Court has said, if you promote a black, and we understand that you have to because that decree is lawful, that also may infringe on the rights of whites. And we think that that gives them a cause of action, and they're entitled to a trial on that. And that was what was new. It means that by following a lawful decree, you've now bought another lawsuit. The white firemen won their 1989 argument in the Supreme Court with the help of a powerful ally, the Justice Department. The irony, of course, is that the Justice Department was on the side of the blacks in 1981. The irony is not lost on James Alexander, the attorney for the city of Birmingham. Uh, I cannot think of anything in my practice that has made me as angry for such a long period of time. <laughs> Who does it make you angry at? The, the uh, Reagan administration? Or? Surely, and, and most particularly the, the political appointees in the Department of Justice. I mean, bear in mind that I came to the negotiation table for the city at the invitation of the Department of Justice. We worked with the Department of Justice, relied on their judgment, negotiated a decree that bears their imprint that is similar to 
I, I think, literally hundreds of other decrees around the country. And then two years later, uh, they are walking into federal court saying that they are challenging the very decree that they negotiated, and it's, it is uh, indefensible conduct. That leaves the city of Birmingham still bound by the decree to promote blacks, but at the same time subject to lawsuits every time a black is promoted over a white who scored higher on the test. Birmingham's mayor, Richard Arrington, has to figure out what Birmingham does now. We have to live by what the law of the land is. If we get to the highest court and we lose it, uh, we'll have to live by it. But it's going to be, uh, I don't want to say devastating, it's going to be difficult. I think for the next 15 or 20 years, we'll probably be in court with white employees uh, suing us. The Supreme Court decision opens the door for these white firemen to challenge affirmative action in Birmingham. It also opens the door for lawsuits all over the country where affirmative action plans have been in place for years. Every white policeman or sanitation worker or civil servant who feels he wasn't hired or not promoted because some lower scoring black got the job might have cause to sue his city for reverse discrimination. Every consent decree in the country that takes race into account is a sitting duck for the kinds of litigation we're experiencing here in Birmingham. If you go anywhere and look into uh, consent decrees where private employees, public employees, doesn't matter, where they have tried to settle race or sex or some other kind of litigation, and they've taken race into account, they've got a problem. The trial of the white firemen against the city of Birmingham, scheduled for this June, may never take place. It may never take place if Congress passes the Civil Rights Act of 1990, which would overturn the Supreme Court decision which gave those white firemen their right to institute the lawsuit. Your recommendation for our business insurer? Wausau, sir. Wausau for workers' comp. And group health. And pensions. And property. And? And no one can beat their service. Wausau, it is. For all your business insurance, it's the professional from Wausau. He's coming back. Pizza? <laughs> Join us in celebrating 41 years of luxury leadership during National Cadillac Week. When you take a test drive, you will be eligible for use of a Cadillac for two weekend days at participating U.S. Avis locations. And take advantage of a bonus of up to $2,000 on America's leading luxury automobiles. National Cadillac Week, April 7th through the 15th. Your invitation to celebrate Cadillac style. Did you know that even though your 800 service is working perfectly, unexpected events can keep you from getting calls? But only AT&T automatically covers you with our 800 assurance policy. Within one hour, we can reroute 800 calls to any working phone, even at home, guaranteed. Reliability, another AT&T advantage. Call today about our special 800 offer. Jake and Blake awake to Kellogg's Oat Bake. Blake? Yes, Angel Cake? Why is it milk you forsake when you partake of Oat Bake? I love Oat Bake straight. Does that aggravate? No, no, my little potentate. May I demonstrate? Well, considerate. Mmm. Raisins, nuts, and spices predominate. So you appreciate. Well, I didn't anticipate that a cereal straight would taste so great. In milk or straight, oat bake tastes wonderful. Huh? I mean, great. Oat bake tastes great. That's great. The other day, we made the mistake of asking Andy, what's up? Everything's up, he said. Every blessed thing you can't do without. Government officials in Washington are always announcing that the rate of inflation is low, something like 5% a year. Why is it then that every time you go to buy something, it's not 5% more, it's 20% more than it was the last time you bought it? You get used to the prices of most things, I think, but there are certain prices I never get used to. You know what I mean. I know a Mercedes or a Cadillac costs $50,000, something like that, and it doesn't surprise me. I don't plan to buy one, but it doesn't surprise me. But now, what about a pair of glasses like this? I swear that this pair of glasses has gone up a lot more than most things in the last five years. 
I paid $85 for these two months ago, and I know for sure I bought a pair almost exactly like them two years ago for $45. Why should a simple pair of glasses cost so much more now? I don't get used to the price of a good pair of shoes, women's shoes, for example. Look at this pair of nothing with all these holes in them, $255. Women get stuck with higher prices for a lot of things. Women's haircuts, for instance, are a lot more than a man's haircut. And all kinds of clothes cost women more. Here's a Macy's ad. The linen jacket is $320. The skirt is $120. I don't know whether you can see the skirt or not. This is the skirt right here. Imagine what it would cost if it came to her knees. And the price of a good hotel room never ceases to amaze me. Here's the actual bill. I stayed at the Palmer House in Chicago in 1975, and it cost me $39. We called this morning. The same room now costs $109. Here's a 1973 bill from a Ramada Inn, $21. Today the room is $84, four times as much. Books seem expensive. Here's a book of a friend of mine I bought, Ernie Pyle. $21.95. Ernie probably didn't make that much a week when he was writing it. The price of a nickel candy bar never fails to surprise me. And have you seen a movie lately? You go to a lot of them? Well, you must be rich. In New York City, a movie now costs $7.50. You think that's special? Look what a movie costs in Hollywood. $7. Wouldn't you think a movie would be cheaper right there where they make them? I guess they don't have factory outlet movie theaters. We'll be back in a moment with the mail. Now you cook it healthy. Mmm, so sweet. I love Mrs. Dash. Shaking on the flavor. Sexy, healthy. I love Mrs. Dash. Mrs. Dash. 14 herbs and spices for healthier flavor instead of salt. Your heart will thank you. We interrupt this program for an important potato announcement. So far in McDonald's Fried Surprise Game, Spud Lovers have won over $25 million in cash and prizes, like Grant Eric Stone, the big $10,000 winner. So get off your couch, potatoes, and play McDonald's Fried Surprise Game today. Ford profiles in quality, continuous improvement. When your goal is to build the highest quality cars and trucks in the world, you can't stand still. For the 1990s, we applied new technology. New thinking in how we build our cars. Today, we're building cars so tight, so solid, so precise. We can compete with anything, made anywhere, by anybody. Coming soon, the all-new Ford Escort and Mercury Tracer. Quality is job one. An American woman, a Chinese rebel. He would teach her love. She would show him freedom. Melissa Gilbert, Forbidden Nights, Tuesday. Spring is in the air. So this is like paperwork warfare? I remember my first time. <laughs> a new time for Sydney. Then, what happens when the Harlows decide to lose a few pounds? Just say no. It's a crash diet. <laughs> on a crash course with sanity. Normal life at a new time, Wednesday. Now the mail. And we received a lot of it in response to our story two weeks ago called Teacher is a Cheater. One letter from the Los Angeles Unified School District objected to our statement that their Franklin Avenue school was one of 68 California schools in which principals and teachers were caught cheating, caught erasing, and correcting wrong answers. They call that statement completely inaccurate. We demand a public retraction and clarification. Well, it wasn't completely inaccurate. The fact is, after an investigation, a number of California teachers and principals were caught cheating and were fired or allowed to resign at some of those 68 schools. However, the Franklin Avenue School was not one of them, even though, according to a state analysis, answers on 25% of the sixth grade tests at that school were changed. Now about schools in South Carolina, which were the focus of our story. Well, we heard from that state superintendent of education, Charlie Williams, who appeared on our broadcast. He called the story an irresponsible, slanderous attack on the integrity and honesty of teachers and you owe them a public apology. He, of course, signed his letter. A lot of teachers we heard from, some of whom worked for Mr. Williams, were understandably reluctant to let us use their names. 
This teacher, for instance. Regardless of what you may have been told by school administrators, the pressure for us to raise test scores any way we can is almost unbearable. There was also a letter from a teacher who wrote, out of the 3,700 teachers in our city, every single elementary school teacher is cheated, including me. Passing items to the jury takes a good deal of time, and it's a matter that's going to be supervised rather closely by most judges in the interest of running an efficient trial. Here are some suggestions. First, don't pass every photograph or other article of demonstrative evidence to the jury. If you do, the impact of the really important ones is going to be lost because it'll become a routine perfunctory matter with the jurors to simply pass these items from one person to another. Secondly, don't pass complicated, uh, detailed forms of demonstrative evidence, such as hospital records, to the jury. It takes too much time, and they aren't going to uh, read them at that point anyway. Third, I'm, I keep saying secondly, I should say either first. Publishing a photograph or other article of demonstrative evidence to the jury is a matter which deserves some thought. Passing items uh, through the jury box requires time, and doing so is a privilege which the court is going to supervise rather closely, in most cases, in the interest of running an efficient trial. Here are some suggestions. First, don't pass every photograph or other article of demonstrative evidence to each juror, or the impact of the really important ones will be lost. Second, don't pass complicated, detailed forms of evidence to the jury, such as hospital records. They won't have time to read them, and they'll simply uh, be passed from one person to another without any purpose or objective being accomplished. Third, consider alternative forms of publishing your evidence to the jury, such as the use of a overhead projector or a slide or blow-ups of certain key items of demonstrative evidence. There are any number of examples, as we've seen in this series, on how we can publish in the courtroom demonstrative evidence to the jury without passing the item from juror to juror. Finally, I would suggest, where possible, that you have a duplicate copy of photographs or other items of evidence available for the judge. Publishing a photograph or other article of demonstrative evidence to the jury is a matter which deserves some thought. It takes time to pass things to the jury, and most judges are going to strictly supervise this privilege in the interest of running an efficient trial. Here are some suggestions. First, don't pass every item of demonstrative evidence to each juror, or the impact of the really important ones is going to be lost. Second. No, I don't want that. Let's try again. Okay. Publishing a photograph or other article of demonstrative evidence to the jury is a matter which deserves some thought. The strike, start again. Publishing. Our photograph or other items of demonstrative evidence to the jury is a matter which deserves some thought. Passing things through the jury box takes time, and the right to do so is going to be strictly su uh, strike. Oh, there we go. Publishing a photograph or other article of demonstrative evidence to the jury is a matter which deserves some thought. It takes time to pass things through the jury box, and this privilege is going to be strictly supervised by most judges in the interest of running an efficient trial. Here are some suggestions. Don't pass every exhibit through the jury box, or the impact of the really important ones will be lost. Second, don't pass complicated, detailed exhibits through the jury box. They won't have time to read them, and they'll just simply be passed from one juror to the next without any purpose being served. Third, 
consider alternative forms of publishing demonstrative evidence for the jury, such as multiple copies of photographs for the, for the members of the jury, the use of an overhead projector to project a, uh, a slide strike. Damn it, I had it too. It was good. It was Publishing a photograph or other article of demonstrative evidence to the jury is a matter which deserves some thought. It takes time to pass things through the jury box, and most judges are going to strictly supervise the privilege of doing so in the interest of running an efficient trial. Here are some suggestions. First, don't pass every exhibit through the jury box, or the impact of the really important ones will be lost. Second, don't pass complicated, detailed exhibits to the jury. They'll simply be passed from one juror to another without anyone taking time to read them, and no purpose is going to be accomplished. Third, consider alternative forms of publishing, such as multiple copies of photographs, the use of an overhead projector, a slide projector, or photographic blow-ups. We've seen many examples in this series of ways of publishing demonstrative evidence for the jury without passing things through the jury box. Finally, where possible, have a duplicate copy of your demonstrative evidence available for the judge. Closely related to the simple still photograph as far as foundation laying is concerned is a diagram. Diagrams, of course, need not be to scale. They can be prepared in advance of trial or they can be prepared by the witness in the presence of the jury. But as with photographs, the sponsoring witness must testify that the diagram is a fair, accurate, good representation of the scene or object shown in, in the diagram. And as a strictly technical evidentiary matter, the witness must also say that the diagram will assist him or her in giving testimony. When you meet those requirements, the diagram should be admitted or you should be allowed to use it unless, of course, the judge decides that it's cumulative or redundant or that what you're using it for isn't relevant. Let's assume in the example which we're going to look at now that the diagram in the illustration has already been marked for evidence. Closely related to the still photograph as far as foundation laying is concerned is the simple diagram. A diagram need not be to scale. It can be prepared in advance of trial or the witness can actually make the drawing or diagram in the presence of the jury on a poster board or a chalkboard. But as with the still photograph, the witness must state that the diagram is a true, accurate, good, fair, or words which represent the equivalent of those, representation of the scene or the object shown on the diagram. And secondly, as a strictly technical evidentiary matter, the witness must also say that the diagram will assist him or her in giving testimony. When you meet those requirements, you should be allowed to use your diagram, unless, of course, the judge finds that the diagram is redundant or cumulative evidence or that you fail to show that there is relevance for the use of the diagram. No, that isn't quite it. Too long. Closely related to the photograph in this matter of foundation laying is the simple diagram. A diagram need not be to scale. It can be prepared in advance of trial, or the witness can make the diagram in the presence of the jury. But as with the photograph, the witness must state that the diagram itself is a fair, accurate, true, good depiction of whatever is shown in the, in the diagram. And also, as a strict evidentiary matter, the witness should state that the diagram will assist him or her in giving testimony. If you meet these requirements, you should be allowed to use the diagram, unless, of course, the judge finds that it's redundant or cumulative or 
if, unless you fail to show that the use of the diagram is relevant for whatever purpose you're offering it. In this example, we'll assume that the diagram has already been marked as an exhibit for identification. Closely related to photographs, as far as foundation laying is concerned, is the simple diagram. A diagram need not be to scale. It can be prepared in advance of trial, or the witness can prepare the diagram in the presence of the jury. But as with the photograph, the witness should state that the diagram is a true, accurate, good, fair representation of whatever is depicted or shown on the diagram. And in addition to that, as a strict evidentiary matter, the witness should also state that the diagram will assist him or her in giving testimony. The test for admissibility once a diagram has been authenticated is simply, will it help the jury? Will it assist the jury in understanding the testimony? So if you meet these requirements, you should be allowed to use your diagram, unless, of course, that the judge finds that it's cumulative or redundant, or unless you fail to show that the diagram is relevant to whatever purpose you're offering it for. In this example, let's assume that the diagram has already been marked for identification. And position time. Okay. Closely related to photographs, as far as foundation laying is concerned, is the simple diagram. A diagram need not be to scale. It can be prepared in advance of trial, or the witness can prepare the diagram in the presence of the jury. When we talk about illustrative forms of demonstrative evidence like a diagram, the only test, once it's authenticated, is will it assist the jury in understanding the testimony of the witness. As a strict evidentiary matter, however, we need to lay a foundation for this. And the witness, therefore, must state, as with the photograph, that the area or the object depicted in the diagram is a fair, accurate, good, or true depiction of whatever is shown. Now you've authenticated it, and if the witness also states that it will assist in giving testimony, you should be allowed to use your diagram, unless, of course, the judge finds that it's redundant or cumulative, wasteful of the court's time, or unless you fail to show that there is relevancy uh, for the, uh, unless you, oh, damn it, I had that. It was so good, too. Really. Closely related to photographs, as far as foundation laying is concerned, is the simple diagram. A diagram need not be to scale. It can be prepared in advance of trial, or the witness can prepare the diagram in the presence of the jury. Once you have authenticated it, the test for the use of a diagram is simply, will it assist the jury in understanding the testimony? But as with the still photograph, it has to be authenticated. The witness must state that the diagram will assist. Damn, I had it. Closely related to photographs, as far as foundation laying is concerned, is the simple diagram. A diagram need not be to scale. It can be prepared in advance of trial, or the witness can prepare it in the presence of the jury. When the diagram is authenticated, the only test for the admission of the diagram or the use of the diagram will assist the jury in understanding the testimony. But as with still photographs, it needs to be authenticated. The witness must state that the diagram is a true, accurate, good, fair depiction of whatever is shown on the diagram. Once it's authenticated, if the witness states that the diagram will assist in giving testimony, you should be allowed to use it, unless, of course, the judge finds that it's redundant or cumulative or wasteful of the court's time, or unless you fail to show that the diagram is relevant for some purpose that you're seeking to use it for. In this example, we'll assume that the diagram has been pre-marked for identification purposes. Not good. Closely related to 
photographs, as far as foundation laying is concerned, is the simple diagram. A diagram need not be to scale, it can be prepared in advance of trial, or the witness can prepare the diagram in the presence of the jury. As with photographs, however, the sponsoring witness must testify that the scene or object depicted in the diagram is a true, accurate, fair, or good representation of whatever is shown. Once that is done, you've authenticated the diagram. Now you should be allowed to use it so long as the witness testifies that that diagram would assist him or her in giving testimony. Unless, of course, the judge finds that it's redundant or wasteful of the court's time or cumulative or unless you fail to show that the use of the diagram is relevant. In this example, we'll assume that this diagram has been marked for identification. Closely related to photographs, as far as foundation laying is concerned, is the simple diagram. A diagram need not be to scale. It can be prepared in advance of trial, or the witness can prepare the diagram in the presence of the jury. As with photographs, however, the sponsoring witness must authenticate the diagram. He or she must state that the diagram is an accurate, a true, a good, or a fair depiction of whatever is shown. Now you've authenticated it, and if the witness testifies that the diagram will assist him or her in giving, te giving testimony, you should be allowed to use it. Unless, of course, the judge finds that it's redundant or cumulative or wasteful of the court's time to use it, or unless you fail to show that its use is relevant. In this example, we'll assume that the diagram has already been marked as an exhibit for identification. Closely related to photographs, as far as foundation laying, laying is concerned. Okay. Closely related to photographs, as far as foundation laying is concerned, is the simple diagram. A diagram need not be to scale. It can be prepared in advance of trial, or it can be prepared by the witness in the presence of the jury. But as with the photograph, the witness must testify that the diagram is a true, accurate, good, or fair depiction of whatever is shown in the diagram. Now you've authenticated it, and if the witness also testifies that the diagram will assist him or her in giving testimony, you should be allowed to use it, unless, of course, the judge decides, strike that. Closely related to photographs, as far as foundation laying is concerned, is the simple diagram. A diagram need not be to scale. It can be prepared in advance of trial, or the witness can prepare the diagram in the presence of the jury. But like the photograph, it must be authenticated. The witness must state that the diagram is a fair, accurate, true, or good depiction of whatever is shown in the diagram. Once you've authenticated the diagram, the test for its use is simply, will it assist the jury in understanding the testimony? If you show that, then you should be allowed to use it, unless, of course, the judge finds that the diagram is redundant or cumulative evidence or is wasteful of the court's time, or unless you fail to show that the diagram is relevant in the case. In this example, we'll assume that the diagram has already been marked for identification. Closely related to photographs, as far as foundation laying is concerned, is the simple diagram. A diagram need not be to scale. It can be prepared in advance of trial, or it can be prepared by the witness in the presence of the jury. But the sponsoring witness must authenticate the diagram. That is, he or she must state that the diagram is a fair, accurate, good, or true depiction of whatever is shown in the diagram. Once you have authenticated it, the next question is, will it assist the jury in understanding the testimony? That's the test for 
the right to use simple illustrative demonstrative evidence like a diagram. Will it assist rather than confuse the jury in understanding the testimony? Establish that, you should be allowed to use your diagram unless the judge finds that the diagram is cumulative or redundant or wasteful of the court's time or unless you fail to show that it's relevant in the case. In this example, we'll assume that the diagram has already been marked for identification. <clears throat> Don't overlap it. When the diagram is, start again. Okay. Where the diagram isn't to scale, opposing counsel is entitled to a limiting instruction, as we just saw. And it's a good idea where our opponent uses a diagram not to scale to consider asking for that kind of limiting instruction if it will serve some purpose. Sometimes we use diagrams simply for illustrative purposes, like a schematic drawing on the chalkboard without any intention of actually marking it or offering it into evidence. Other times, however, we want our diagram in the jury room. Let's look at the steps for marking and authenticating and offering a diagram into evidence now. Where a diagram isn't to scale, Opposing counsel is entitled to a limiting instruction, as we've just seen. And we should consider asking for such a limiting instruction when our opponent uses a not-to-scale diagram, if some purpose is going to be served by that kind of request. Sometimes we want our diagram to serve only for illustrative purposes, like the schematic drawing on a chalkboard. We don't mark it. We don't offer it into evidence. Other times, however, we want that diagram with the jury. So we mark it and we offer it into evidence. Let's look at the steps now for doing that. Where the diagram isn't to scale, opposing counsel is entitled to a limiting instruction, as we just saw. And we should consider asking for that kind of instruction where our opponent uses a not to scale diagram, if some purpose is going to be served by that request. Sometimes. We use a diagram for illustrative purposes only, just to help the witness explain something, with no intention of marking or offering the diagram into evidence, like the schematic drawing on a chalkboard. Other times, however, we want that diagram with the jury. In those cases, we need to mark it and offer it into evidence, just like the photograph. Let's look at the steps for doing that. Where the diagram isn't to scale, the opposing counsel is entitled to a limiting instruction, as we've just seen. And we should consider asking for that kind of instruction where our opponent uses a not to scale diagram, if that kind of request will serve some purpose. Sometimes we use a diagram simply for illustrative purposes, just to help the witness explain the testimony a little bit better without any intention of actually offering the diagram into evidence, like a schematic drawing on a chalkboard. Other times, however, we want that diagram with the jury. In those cases, we need to offer it into evidence properly and know how to mark it so that the jury will understand those markings when it has it in the deliberative phase. Let's look at how to do that. Yes. No, I'll start again. I was right here. Okay. Where the diagram isn't to scale, opposing counsel is entitled to a limiting instructions. Start again. Okay. Where the diagram isn't to scale, opposing counsel is entitled to a limiting instruction, as we've just seen. And we should consider asking for that kind of instruction where our opponent uses a not to scale diagram if that request will serve some purpose. Sometimes we use a diagram simply for illustrative purposes to help the witness explain his or her testimony a little bit better like a schematic drawing on a chalkboard without any intention, in other words, of offering it into evidence. Other times, we want that diagram in evidence. We want to mark it so that the jury will have the benefit of the markings and the diagram during the deliberations. Let's look at the next step for getting the diagram into evidence and marking it properly.
Where the diagram isn't to scale, opposing counsel is entitled to a limiting instruction, as we've just seen, and we should consider asking for that kind of instruction where our opponent uses a not to scale diagram, if that request would serve some purpose. Sometimes we use diagrams simply for illustrative purposes, to help the witness explain the testimony a little bit better, without any intention of actually offering the diagram into evidence, like a schematic drawing on a chalkboard, for example. Other times, however, we want to offer the diagram into evidence and mark it so the jury will have the benefit of that demonstrative evidence during its deliberations. Let's look at the next steps, which are to offer the exhibit and to mark it properly. Notice that all of the markings were on the diagram in this case before it was finally offered into evidence. Many judges prefer that all markings be put on a diagram before it is finally offered into evidence, and some judges won't permit further markings on a diagram after the uh, exhibit is received in evidence. So the better practice is to use the approach demonstrated here. No, that's a bad. Notice that the diagram here wasn't offered into evidence until all of the markings were on it. Many judges prefer that a chart or a diagram be completely marked before it is offered into evidence. And some judges won't permit any further markings on a diagram after it is received in evidence. So the better practice is the approach demonstrated here. Notice that the diagram wasn't offered here until all of the markings were on it. Many judges prefer that all the markings be on a diagram before it is finally offered into evidence, and some judges won't permit any further markings on a diagram after it is received into evidence. I didn't want to say that. I want to say exhibit, not just diagram. OK, here we go. Notice that the diagram wasn't offered into evidence until all of the markings were on it. Many judges prefer that all markings be placed on an exhibit before it is finally offered into evidence, and some judges won't permit any further markings on an exhibit after it is finally received in evidence. So the better practice is to follow the approach which we've demonstrated here. I wasn't ready, sorry. Notice that the diagram wasn't offered into evidence until all of the markings were on it. Many judges prefer that all the markings be placed on a diagram before it is finally offered into evidence, and some judges won't permit any further markings on an exhibit after it is received into evidence. So the better practice is to use the approach which we've just seen. Now let's consider models. Models of all kinds are becoming increasingly common in courtrooms. We've seen examples in this series of how to use anatomical models. And we saw, for example, that all that is required uh, to use an anatomical model is to show that it's accurate and have the witness testify that it will assist him or her in explaining the testimony to the jury. Many times, however, we may want to use a much larger model than an anatomical one. And it's not always a simple matter of just making it and bringing it into court. Models, large models at least, pose logistical problems for courts. They're difficult to store. They take up a lot of space in the courtroom. And even though they're very dramatic pieces of demonstrative evidence and can help impress the jury with how hard we are working, the effort justification hypothesis that we talked about in part one, Notwithstanding these facts, judges will sometimes resist letting us use large models 
unless we show that the witness really needs the model to help in the explanation of the testimony. In the example which follows, we try to demonstrate first how to show that the witness needs the model to explain his testimony. And we also attempt to show a second point, and that is how to avoid prematurely showing the model to the jury until it has been properly authenticated and a foundation has been laid for it. A matter of protocol, in other words. Now, let's consider models. Models of all kinds are becoming increasingly common in the courtroom. I suppose the one we most often use is the anatomical model the skull, the skeleton, the model of the knee, whatever. But sometimes it can be extremely helpful to use a much larger model. For example, one of a highway accident scene, or of a railroad yard, or of a piece of machinery, or of a building. Wherever it is, we want to take the jury in their mind's eye and to help wit the witnesses who will come into the courtroom explain their testimony very good way to dramatize our testimony and to show the jury that we're working hard to help them understand what happened. But many judges are reluctant to let us use models because they pose logistical problems. They're large, difficult to store, they take up a lot of space, and for that reason we need to be particularly careful. First, to show the court that as far as the witness or witnesses who will use the model are concerned, they need that model to explain their testimony to the jury. The second thing we should be careful of when we use a dramatic kind of model, or at least one that is going to be seen as dramatic by the judge, is not to display that on, to the jury until the proper foundation has been laid. In this example, we show how to establish first need and secondly to avoid displaying the model until the foundation has been laid. Now, let's consider models. Models of all kinds are becoming increasingly common in the courtroom. I suppose the one we most often use is the anatomical model. The skull, the skeleton, the anatomical model of the knee, whatever. However, a model of a machine, of an accident site, a railroad yard, a building, that kind of thing can be extremely helpful in dramatizing our case for the jury and sh to show the jury how hard we're working at helping them understand what happened. Large scale models, however, do pose some problems. Some logistical problems for the court because they're difficult to store, because they take up a lot of space. And for that reason, many judges will require a strict showing that this kind of model is necessary in explaining testimony. Another thing to consider is the fact that the judge may not like it if you show the jury this large, rather dramatic model before the proper foundation has been laid. In this example, we show how to both show the judge that our witness or witnesses need the model to explain their testimony, and secondly, how to avoid prematurely displaying it to the jury. Next, let's consider models. Models of all kinds are being increasingly used in all kinds of cases. I suppose the one we see most frequently is the anatomical model, the skull, the skeleton, the model of the knee, or whatever. And we've seen, seen examples of anatomical models in this series. We know that ordinarily all we need to do is have the doctor say that it's anatomically correct and that it would assist in giving testimony. But there are many other kinds of models that we might consider. Models of accident sites, railroad yards, construction sites, buildings, machines, all kinds that can help a jury understand our case, to dramatize our case for the jury, and indeed to impress the jury with how hard we're working to help them make a proper decision. The effort justification hypothesis that we talked about in part one. Large scale models, however, do pose some problems. First, logistical problems for the court. They're difficult to store, 
They take up a lot of room in the courtroom. And for that reason, many judges require a showing that our witness or witnesses really need the model to testify. Also, the model, the large model, must not, no oh, strike, I, I didn't like that anyway. Do you like that? Now let's consider models. Yeah. What? Talk too soon. Now let's consider models. Hmm? What's the Now let's consider models. Models of all kinds are being increasingly used in trials. The most common, I suppose, is the anatomical model of the skull, the spine, the knee, or whatever. And we know, as we've seen in this series, that all we need do where we use a model is to have the doctor say that the model is anatomically correct and would assist in giving testimony. But there are other, no, no, I don't like that. Mm -mm. Now, let's consider models. Models of all kinds are used in... <laughs> now, let's consider for a moment... No, I don't say for a moment. Here we go. Try again. Now, let's consider models. These are being increasingly used in trials of all kinds. I suppose the most common is the anatomical model, and we've seen examples in this series of how to lay a foundation for the use of an anatomical model, like one of the skull or the spine or the knee. But there are many other kinds of models we might use to dramatize our case for the jury and help them understand what happened and to help our witnesses explain their testimony models of accident sites, railroad yards, traffic accident scenes, machines, buildings. The variety and possibilities are almost limitless. But large-scale models do pose some problems we need to be aware of. First, some logistical problems for the court. They're difficult to store. They take up a lot of space. For that reason, many judges will require us to show that we really need the model for our witnesses to explain their testimony. Also, models shouldn't be displayed to the jury until a proper foundation has been laid. To just show a large dramatic model to the jury may really be offensive to the judge and can get us into some difficulties. So we need to know how to avoid displaying it until the proper foundation has been laid. In this example, we show how to do that. First, to show a need for the use of the model? No, no, fell apart. Mm -mm, fell. Now, models. These are being increasingly used in all kinds of trials. The most common, of course, is the simple anatomical model, the skull, the heart, the back, the knee, the kinds of things we've seen used in our demonstrations in this series. But there are many other kinds of models other than those which deal with medical issues. Models of buildings, construction sites, traffic accident scenes, railroad yards, machines, whatever it is that we need to help dramatize our case and to help our witnesses explain what happened. Large-scale models, however, do pose some problems. Logistical problems for the court because they're difficult to store, they take up a lot of space, and for that reason, many judges will require that we show that our witnesses need this large-scale model to testify. Also, we should be aware of the fact that a dramatic model shouldn't be displayed for the jury until a proper foundation has been laid. In this example, we show how to deal with both those problems. First, to show a need for the model, and secondly, to avoid displaying it prematurely to the jury.